Hello, and thank you for welcoming me to participate in a wonderful new initiative by the New England Society of Botanical Artists to bring the experiences of artists to life. This is a talk about how I transformed an experience of bats, caves, and ants into a career of science to which my art is central. And as I tell this story, I hope to give you a glimpse of some of the amazing creatures that inhabit a part of the tropics that we rarely consider among the stereotypical white sand beaches and verdant rainforests. This is the dry forest of Puerto Rico. Let's take a moment now though, to consider the substantial destruction wrought by severe hurricanes this year on the human inhabitants of Puerto Rico and all of the or other organisms that live there. I'm going to go back a bit into time when I was a master's student at the University of Vermont in 1991. On a field trip then to Puerto Rico, I spotted something fascinating to me because I'm something of a nature nerd. This was an unusual interaction between plants and ants. Yeah, ants, the little things that run the world, according to E.O. Wilson and myself. I'd long been studying the ecology that drives the relationships between plants and insects, including mangroves and the amazing diversity of bugs that eat them, the ants that live inside the swollen bulbs of orchids that inhabit mangrove swamps, and wild and wacky crab spiders. In fact, much later, I would illustrate whole books on ants and spiders, but that's another story. So I had my interest peaked, and I decided to return to Puerto Rico and work in the place where I'd first spotted this strange interaction. And there I landed, a couple of days after my wedding, on an ecological honeymoon. My husband remained in the States as he had other responsibilities, including cleaning up from our potluck wedding for 150 people. My study focused on the world-renowned Guanica Dry Forest of southwestern Puerto Rico, which is a United Nations biosphere reserve. And it's been called perhaps the best example of subtropical dry forest in the world. Now, only 1% of the dry forest that originally covered the planet remains, and so this spot is truly special. It's home to several rare and endemic species, that, that is, species that are found nowhere else on Earth, including the Puerto Rican nightjar, the Puerto Rican crested toad, and a beautiful but endangered orchid seen clambering here up a, an amazing cactus. This is Cyclus crugii. This forest grows on karst. This is Swiss cheesy limestone bedrock that easily erodes and is pockmarked with arroyos and sinkholes and caves. Now, one of the most extensive cave complexes in Guanica is the Cueva de Murciélagos, or the Cave of Bats. And it's chock full of bats. The Jamaican fruit bat and the Antillean fruit bat. <laughs> Dig the nose on that guy. Of an evening, Thousands of bats will emerge from this cave to feast on the fruit of many species of plants. And here's where I did my research. 
Probably the riskiest part of my work was the potential to be pooped on by bats or to slip on the bat guano that has accumulated on the cave floor over thousands of years. And I will share with you that I did sacrifice a pair of really nice hiking boots for this research. Part of the cave ceiling had collapsed and a new kind of forest had taken root on the cave floor and the rim of that sinkhole. The trees there could take advantage of the cool, moist microclimate of the cave and the soils that were full of nutrient-rich bat poop. But these conditions contrasted sharply with the surrounding hot, dry, nutrient-poor conditions of the dry forest. And as such, the vegetation of these karst pockets contrasted sharply with the dry adaptive vegetation of the surroundings. I discovered an unusual species of tree, Cecropia peltata, growing in the cave, which was found nowhere else in the whole reserve. This is a fast-growing tree of young rainforests, not dry places. If it were growing out in the blazing sun, its huge hand-shaped leaves would shrivel. In fact, the closest population of this tree species occurred nearly 15 miles away in higher elevation, moist forests. So how did that tree get there? Well, possibly by Batmobile. But bats don't tend to fly too far from their haunts as troglodytes. More likely, its seeds were dropped by pearly-eyed thrashers, which are common nesters at the northern entrance to the cave. Oh yeah, and, and so what about the ants? I had seen swarms of them congregating around the trees. In other parts of the tropical Americas on the mainland of South America, ants inhabit the hollow stems of cecropia trees feeding off of protein-rich organs that the trees produce, precisely to entice ants. And in return, the ants, which are all of the genus Azteca, protect Cecropias from other insects and creatures that would eat the trees. And this mutualistic relationship, though, is unknown in the Caribbean islands, where Cecropias are relatively recent colonizers and they've escaped their major herbivores. There are no herbivores on Caribbean islands that specifically feed on Cecropia trees. So the trees don't need to expend the energy to produce food for ants. So I was really surprised to see some ants so interested in the trees. Could this be a newly evolving mutualism? Well, possibly. But it turns out that my ants of interest were appropriately called crazy ants, Paratrachina longicornis. And it is a seriously crazy ant, not only because of its scruffy looks. Here's a drawing I did on the left for the field guide to the ants of New England. So far, these crazy ants are found only in southern Connecticut. Um, but it's also known because of its crazy, erratic movements. And here are some crazy ants on the right feeding on some of these protein-rich bodies. Well, after having solved that mystery, I set about documenting the species diversity of plants in the biosphere reserve, looking both at the dry forest and at the more moist environments created by sunken caves and arroyos and streams. And I recorded several hundred plant species. I did encounter another adventure, though, as I traversed the dry forest, including relatives of ants. The wasps. Now, there are several yellow jackets that are widespread in the area, and they hang their incredibly hard-to-see paper nests under leaves. Well, inevitably, I bumped into one 
getting a whole bunch of stings on my face. I ripped off my glasses to release the wasps that were attacking my eyes and then rescued my glasses and recovered my sight, thankfully. I wandered out of my field site into the three-mile path that would take me back to my car. Looking way too much like the elephant man that I'm just not going to show you here, um, I ran into a really confused older gentleman who amiably asked me how to get back to the park headquarters. He clearly did not notice my swelling face. I directed him to turn around, but a couple of moments later, his distraught daughter walked off of a separate trail and asked me if I had seen an elderly lost man, and I mumbled through a quickly swelling mouth that I had, and he was on his way back. She didn't seem to notice the stings either, but she did thank me profusely. But perhaps the most fun I had in Guanica was producing a field guide to the trails of Guanica, which I was asked to do by Miguel Canals and other senior staff there. And this assignment gave me a wonderful excuse to spend hours in the Biosphere Reserve observing and sketching. Now, some of you young'uns may not relate to this, but to produce a field guide in those days in a remote outpost involved cutting and pasting. Literally. I'm talking scotch tape. We had copy machines and computers, really wonky computers, actually, but no scanners and no Photoshop. Thus, the drawings needed to be simple, clear pen and inks interspersed with text. Nevertheless, however imperfect the original paste-up was, I do still hear from people that the guide is still given out to tourists visiting Guanica. And it's actually housed at the New York Botanical Garden. And I just checked, and it's on Amazon, and still recommended for travelers. Who'd have thunk? Puerto Rico is a magnificent place. And I encourage you to go there, to sketch, to revel in its biodiversity. And I also encourage you to remember how fragile these places and their people are. Climate change is upon us. The Caribbean is warming. The frequency and severity of storms is only set to increase. And as a community of artists, we have a responsibility to act in our own ways and also to use our gifts to document the biodiversity of these islands and how it is changing. So I thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you today. And you are a fabulous group. Let's continue our work into the future.